one. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 113th episode of the Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. You can call me JAG. I'm the CEO of the Atlas Society. We are the leading nonprofit introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, creative ways like graphic novels and animated videos. Uh, today, we are joined by Robert Anthony Peters. Before I even begin to introduce our guest, I want to um, invite all of you who are watching us on Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube, start typing in your questions now. I have a feeling we're going to be able to get to many of them, so just type them into your uh, chat. So our guest today, Robert Anthony Peters, is an actor, director, and frequent lecturer on a variety of art and liberty topics. He is the producer behind the uh, short film Tank Man, which was inspired by the iconic image of the man rocking tanks in Tiananmen Square uh, in 1989. Robert also operates uh, as the vice chairman of the Fully Informed Jury Association, which works to educate people about jurors' rights and responsibilities to execute, uh, to exercise jury nullification. Robert, thanks again uh, for joining us. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. So um, first, I would love to hear a bit about your origin story, where you grew up, uh, what may have influenced your ideas today and set you on the path to your current work and passion. Because I feel like a superhero now, the <laughs> story. It seems like every, uh, every franchise has all these coming out. We're fascinated by the beginnings, aren't we? Uh, I, I grew up in San Francisco, um, which doesn't seem like uh, an expected place for a libertarian to come from. But certainly there's the kind of open-mindedness aspect, or there at least was at one time. Uh, we, we could talk about how liberalism yeah. has throughout the years. Um, I, I, I grew up in, I'm in San Francisco now and grew up in Massachusetts, and I actually find that sometimes uh, the, the strongest, um, most resilient, most persevering libertarians come from places like Massachusetts. Grover Norquist is an, another Massachusetts yes. uh, product. And then of course, Canada as well. So many um, of our donors and of course, um, our scholar, Stephen Hicks. So there's something about being fired in a hostile environment, I think that can make you wake up and say, hey, I'm not okay with this. And um, I'm gonna be, if I can survive San Francisco, Massachusetts, uh, Canada with your ideas intact, you're gonna be on a, a good path to defend them going forward. So anyway, so, so San yeah. Francisco. No, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, I just remember being a kid and kind of there were adults in, in our lives who would kind of indicate that I should feel bad for being white or for being male or, you know, middle class or all of these things. And just thinking like, this just doesn't make sense. I couldn't buy into that, that we would be guilty of something by virtue of how we were born or what circumstance we were created into, um, as opposed to, didn't, wouldn't it make sense to judge somebody more by the things that they do, the choices that they make? So. You know, I, I, I tended to reject that dominant narrative that was there and, uh, you know, just uh, really I, probably as, as a good young person, I was rebellious. And so I was you know, just much more of a contrarian in nature. And so I knew that what they were telling me wasn't right. And so I kind of went to the opposite side of what I felt was right. So I did a lot of listening to Rush Limbaugh when I was young. And, were your parents um, uh, liberal Democrats like mine, or were they uh, a little bit uh, somewhere else on the ideological spectrum? Yeah, you know, my mom was <laughs> too interested, but she also grew up in San Francisco. And uh, I think she had more, wasn't, uh, had hippie sensibilities, not in kind of the holistic sort of way, but just more open-minded. Um, 
And, uh, but also she grew up as a Catholic, so had that kind of conservative, the kind of conservative liberal tension that I think probably is uh, what, what might breed libertarians. Um, my dad was somewhat more of a, a Goldwater guy. He had gone to a high school in Arizona and had spent a good amount of time there. And I think that kind of influenced him, but politics wasn't really something that was talked about much in the house, but I gravitated towards it. I think uh, I wasn't much of an athlete when I was a kid. I was a much bigger reader. So I think I had enjoyed really, um, you know, exploring the ideas and, and kind of enjoying getting people riled up with my contrarian views. So, um, Were there some books uh, as a reader, were there some books that kind of helped to clarify or set you on a, your kind of inform your intellectual trajectory? Yeah, I would say one of the big ones that was really kind of surprising, Look, a, a couple of big ones really come to mind. One was something that most school kids read at some point uh, was To Kill a Mockingbird, which my mom gave me. Uh, she had me read, I think, it, like in the summer of my fourth grade. And just what an important examination of what both individuals can do. I mean, the Atticus Finch character is just, uh, I still admire him tremendously. Um, although, if you've seen the, the Broadway adaptation of it, the recent one, it's it's a shame what they did to it. We can talk about that later. It makes me sick. But, um, beautiful story. And then eighth grade, I did a debate camp, and the topic was a way of people to rebel. So we were reading John Locke's second treatise. Yeah. I just remember, thinking, this is so cool. This is just amazing stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I was, you know, in eighth grade, I was a Lockean. Uh, so I was kind of hooked from there. But I had... Um, my dad, I'd worked with my dad in his business when I was a kid and, and um, he had a stamp and coin business in the peninsula uh, in Burlingate. And people would come in and bring weird things uh, sometimes for him to buy. And sometimes it was gold or silver, precious metals. And we'd bring it to a guy named Bert Blummert. And Bert was a huge libertarian. And he provided a lot of seed money for the Mises Institute and was a big Ron Paul supporter. Order. So we go there. I'd be like, yeah, you know, like 11 years old, and he'd give me a copy of uh, Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? And so I'd go home and read this and be like, oh, this is really cool. So I had, uh, fortunately, I had some intellectual uh, ammunition to help me out with that contrary event along the way. So um, in your bio, you say that you've been a libertarian longer than you've been an actor. Uh, do many people in Hollywood um, generally know that you're a libertarian or are you in the closet? And um, to the extent that you're not, has it? do you feel like it's affected your career at all? You know, I'm not very closeted about it but I'm also not famous. So it doesn't hurt me, I don't think, because nobody knows or cares, you know. Um, uh, it's interesting though, on, on smaller scale things, I think it's been somewhat of a cost uh, with theater in particular. You know, the stakes are lower, so they can afford to really discriminate on those, those aspects. Uh, so I you know, and, and I think even, even less than in film, people in theater tend to care more about what your ideology is and whether you fit that narrative or not. So I've had some problems in that arena um, with it, uh, but it's okay. I don't mind. I mean, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about the ideas I believe in. So I'm very comfortable with that. And it's a small price to pay if I'm in this on certain opportunities. And then, of course, you create your uh, own opportunity in your short film, Tank Man, uh, about the iconic scene from the terrible Tiananmen Square massacre of uh, a regular man carrying bags while um, shopping, uh, while, while stopping a, a column of tanks uh, by just standing in the way. So um, how did you come up with uh, the idea to dramatize your take on his story and uh, how um, and how he came to that place in, in history. Yeah, you know, I think like a lot of people, I've always been fascinated by 
that image. Yeah, you'd go see the poster on the wall. And, um, it's, it's one of the most famous images of the 20th century, uh, incredibly inspirational. And I think just by natural curiosity and I think some of that's the curiosity of, as being an actor as well, you know, you want to know what motivates behavior. What, you know, why does a seemingly regular guy do this highly irregular thing? I mean, I'd like to think I would do the same thing, but I'm not 100% sure. It takes a tremendous amount of guts to, uh, to look down a tank and, and say, yeah, it's either you or me, buddy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's this one, but I'm going to stand there anyway. So, you know, you just sit there and say, gosh, you know, this isn't staged. This isn't photoshopped. What? What's the story here? What would make somebody do that? And so I just, I tried to think back. Okay, what do we know about the guy? Start with that. Well, what did we know about him? Next to nothing. You know, what we see in that picture, what we see in the, in the footage. Um, but, but you look at, at that and it's just, he's a guy wearing black pants, white shirt. He's got some bags. It looks like groceries maybe or something like that. And uh, he's just standing there. And, you know, he, he, so he just looks like a regular fellow. He's not wearing a uniform. He's not Hercules, you know, he's not out there with an AK-47. He's not some big, massive dude that you think, man, this guy was just bred to be a hero, to be a warrior. He looks like just a regular guy. So, okay, well, I'm going to tell a story of a regular guy doing an amazing thing. And, uh, you know, yeah, I had... I hadn't set out necessarily to this story, but uh, a mutual friend of ours, Patrick Reasonover, had run an organization called Talkies to Nexus, and he did film ideas, and he would ask me to say, what he got. And so it's like, well, I have this one idea. Uh, I have a lot of ideas, but this is the one that I, I, I tend to gravitate to and think about. So you, know, you got to submit it. And so I did, and they ended up uh, selecting it. And... Um, so we, we made the film. Um, I didn't want to make it at first because making a film is a lot of work. And uh, I'm actually being an actor, man. You've got the easiest job on set, you know? But, uh, making the film is a tremendous amount of work. But now I'm kind of addicted and it's tremendously rewarding to, to really uh, craft something yourself. You know? As an actor, you kind of get jobbed in. You don't necessarily know what you're working on or what the message will be or anything like that. And so it can be a little dicey but to be able to have greater control over those aspects. Incredibly rewarding. I mean, you just get that satisfaction of the creator even more so. It's great. I love it. All right. Well, we've got a few questions coming in already. I have uh, several more of my own, but um, the audience always has, uh, has interesting and, uh, and surprising ones. Um, this one is, a little bit uh, off topic, but uh, well, I'll ask it anyway. Candace Parker on Facebook asks, if you see any difference between modern liberal and conservative politicians? Modern liberal and conservative politicians? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly it's, it's, it's scary when at times when there are moments when conservatives seem more open-minded, more tolerant and accepting, and modern liberals um, seems to turn the, the concept of some of these things on their heads. Uh, and I think conservative, the conservative tradition has room for toleration for sure. Um, it's supposed to be a hallmark of liberalism, but it's certainly not there in the modern sense. I'm not a political philosopher, but these are just my, my casual opinions on the matter. Okay, on Instagram, Danny KT asks, what has been the biggest influence on your career creatively? Um, wow, that, that is a great question. I'm sure I, I should for your, uh, for the purposes of the podcast, say Hein Rand, but that would be lying. So I, although I do love Ayn Rand. Um, yeah, well, I, also you had this interesting project that, uh, that you did an adaptation um, of her night of January 16th. So tell us a little bit about how that came about. Oh yeah, that was great. Um, I, uh, I'm always trying to find ways to combine 
culture with liberty. And so uh, I, I'll approach people, different events, uh, about what can we do to, to bring these ideas to life in a more artistic way? And I've given a lot of talks to relate the two, but, um, but it's fun when you get to do a, a real execution at a real project. So uh, one year for Pork Fest, um, we produced a, a main stage event of a production of staged reading of night of January the 16th. And it went really well. It's very popular and it's such a big cast. So we were able to cast uh, a lot of the, I'll call them the celebrities who were there, a lot of the speakers um, and the luminaries in the movement to, to come and play various roles. And it was fun. I mean, I think you have like, you know, some anarchist playing a you know, cop or something like that. So, you know, the opportunities to have a good time with, with turning some of these notions on their heads. But, um, but it was great. And we had a, uh, a jury go out and vote on it. And uh, I'm sure they found the hero not guilty. Um, uh, yeah, I felt like it was a it was a fun contribution to uh, getting objectivism more out there, to getting the ideas of liberty out there, and and, uh, and giving people a, a good time while we're at it as well. I love it. I love it. You know that um, that the experience of seeing that play adapted into a film uh, was part of what inspired. The Fountainhead with uh, for Ayn Rand because um, the the play and the and the film adaptation are you know, complete complete uh, kind of uh, antitheses with the the hero being presented as villains and the villains being presented as heroes and so um, with Fountainhead Ayn Rand wanted to present a um, an ideal man who would not compromise his creative vision for anything not even the sake of the woman he loved. So uh, I guess it's another way of looking at sometimes even um, artistic frustrations, setbacks um, can be there for a reason or they'll, they'll be there for what we decide to make them into. And if we want to, um, to try and, and make something positive of it, clearly Ayn Rand did that with, uh, with the Fountainhead. I think all artists can certainly relate to that dilemma and uh, and some can, can relate to how to deal with it as well. I know we had some issues with Tank Man with uh, con conflicting visions and uh, but you know, that was my, not going to allow it to be anything but the project I wanted it to be as, as much as we can, you know, as much as you can bring your idea into reality. Uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> There are some, I, I could see if some might call me difficult to work, but, but it just, you know, but, but fortunately, most of the people understand it's just because I'm truly passionate about it. We got to have, we got to do this the right way, not cut corners and not um, cheat the audience and, and not make anything less than the best we're capable of. So, yeah, it's, to me, it's hard worth it in the end. Another great question, this one from Twitter from Marianne S asking, was there any feedback of Tank Man by the CCP? Um, I, I wouldn't say directly. Uh, we, we haven't had that. But certainly, we've had our challenges. We've had uh, challenges with bots for uh, things online. Um, we've uh, definitely, one of the Fun accusations I get uh, is that we're obviously a, this is a CIA funded uh, project, which I think uh, this would have been so much better if we had that kind of money at our disposal, which isn't necessarily true. Um, uh, yeah, no, money, honestly, money. I sometimes feel that um, people will ask me running the Atlas Society, how do you come up with all these creative ideas? What, what makes you so creative? And part of it is you know, we don't have a lot of money. I think if we had a lot of money, we probably would just be like, oh, okay, well, let's just uh, run a ad for that was shrugged in the New York Times. But um, yeah. it's that's to me one of the fun things. I mean, you know, which isn't to say, folks, if you're access. out there <laughs> to not give to the Atlas Society, <laughs> they want because, the money. yeah. 
Um, I think it's, you know, well, I promise I will continue to be uh, creative because now we've got, we've got our, our method, we've got kind of our franchise, we've got our vehicles, um, but in kind of coming up with those in the first place, whether it was the graphic novels or animated videos, or, you know, the speaking of Patrick Reason over the, the living history projects, Patrick and, um, and also uh, Jeffrey Tucker, who did uh, the, the first, my first Ayn Rand living history impersonation where I was absolutely scared witless, but uh, so that was, that was fun. And, you know, some people loved it and some people really hated it. Like, you know, yeah. as if you'd be uh, uh, representing Muhammad or something, but that's not kind of our take at the Atlas Society. We're not about conflating ideas uh, with personalities. So a very loving rendition. That's great. Yeah, no, that, the, the obstacles often make the art better, right? I mean, not only do they force us to be more creative, but it's amazing the happy accidents that can occur too, um, that you have to be open to because you don't have a choice. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but it's, it's so exciting. And that's, you know, I haven't had as much access to bigger projects, whether performing and obviously producing, uh, not at all. But, um, but it's, to me, it's so fun and so exciting to be, on smaller scale things where it's like, okay, we've got big vision. Now, how do we scale this as much as we can or what, I don't wanna say sacrifices, what changes do we have to make uh, to, right to worry um, without having, yeah, you know, without being able to just get a helicopter to come in, you know? Well, speaking of uh, scaling things up, Kristen Tynan on Facebook asks, is there any possibility Tank Man could be turned into a feature length film? Hey, Kirsten, thanks for asking. Yeah, I, I, that's one of the dreams uh, that I'm hoping we, we can realize in the next decade would be to make a feature film version telling the same, telling the story about that event about him in Square from several different perspectives in one feature film and um you know we do have people who are interested in it we are working on creating something that's doable it will be uh, has challenges in a lot of ways i mean uh, the chinese government does have a lot of influence in hollywood and um and, and funds a lot of things and, and we don't take kindly to people who uh we step out of line. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's okay. I mean, it's, well, it's okay for me. I mean, it doesn't bother me, fortunately. Right? But it's, we actually, this is the first time I can, I, I had an interview to really talk about this, but I had an actor recently return to China and uh, he had requested that we take his name off of the project uh, because that can cause serious problems uh, for him out there, which you know, as much as we got problems in the U.S., we don't have problems like that. And it's just, it's a shame that that's going on. And years ago, I used to want to really make um, uh, projects that would hammer the Soviet Union. And I still do. They still deserve it. But to me, to have this living, breathing entity, this, the Chinese government has a continuity from when it started in, in, in 1949 and have that. Um, you know, just those, nobody has had to apologize for any of its sins, uh, no turnover. It's the same ruling entity. And it's just, it's a shame. It's, uh, and, and they're, unfortunately, they're, they're backsliding. There had been a time, actually, the sad part is uh, Deng Xiaoping, who was responsible for the Tiananmen Square Massacre, was probably their best leader um, post Mao. Well, including now, obviously, but since since their turn to communism, and of course he wasn't amazing. He was their best leader, and, and it's not improved since then. They're, they're backsliding. Uh, and it's it's really sad to witness, uh, and especially when we see what's happening with Hong Kong. Uh, and you're yeah. I'm sure you're aware of the documentary they made about Jimmy Lai, who's now doing 14 months. Um, I screened Tank Man in Hong Kong. 
and the uh, founder of the June 4th Museum, the museum to commemorate what happened in Tiananmen Square. He's now doing 18 months, um, and he, you know, he took me to lunch. And it was like, I, I just had to the table from this guy. Now he's in, in jail because he ran a museum and he talks about ideas like democracy and liberty. It's, it's, um, it's a shame that, that this goes on and, and it's not even that big of a deal. You know, the rest of the world seems to, to feel like this is okay, that this is happening. I guess because China has so much clout. Uh, I feel like we need a lot more people who are willing to speak out about that. It'll, it'll rise up. Agree, agree. Well, we did our one of our most successful uh, Draw My Lives. My name is Hong Kong. And, um, but it was interesting. I shared it with uh, a, a venture capitalist that I met who does, um, he's a Hong Kong native and does a lot of business there. Um, and they are just uh, not willing to even privately go against uh, the CCP and um, just will talk about what happened in Hong Kong in terms of hooligans and troublemakers. And so, um, and, yeah, it's, it's really a shame. I mean, I had the uh, privilege of being able to march and protest with them in 2019 when I was over there. Mm -hmm. And just the, the quality of the people that were largely involved. And even when you, uh, when you saw uh, what happened when they had, um, entered the ledge code, the legislative building, you know, they had little signs next to things like, like, like art pieces, like, this is, this is an antique, like, don't break this, you know, and it was fine. I mean, all of their actions were very targeted. Now, I, I'm sure there are examples of things that were problems at, at different points in, in different protests, but for the most part, that's what you saw, or you'd see people picking up garbage after a protest. Could you imagine that less people doing anything along these lines? Like, I, I can't, I usually. Uh, I can definitely for like a tea party rally. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this was how these largely went. And of course, they, they got painted very poorly and people responsible. Now we've got, China has that national security law which not only extends into Hong Kong, but extends anywhere. So I hate to, I'm sorry to have made you complicit, but I'm sure you've probably violated their national security law here. So you, know, you and I would both be prosecutable should we ever go to China. Well, I mean, we're, we're prosecutable now. But if we go to China, you might have to be careful. It's, uh, this could be evidence against you. You don't have to be in China now to be guilty. Yeah, not anyway. not right up there on my my uh, top of my bucket list, but um, uh, so I want to get back to your film. Um, in your story, you present Tank Man as someone who at first does not want to get involved. Um, he just wants to mind his own business. He wants to get back home. He's got a family, uh, but he changes as he sees events unfolding, and um, no one else knowing you know what to do or stepping forward so is uh is part of the message that any individual can take a stand uh, when they see government tyranny um or other big violations of individual rights i think that's that's definitely one of the things i'd like to come across um yeah i i grew up reading a lot of myths and legends and, and I, I love them and I still love them. Uh, to me, it's, it's a lot of fun to go back and read Hercules or Jason and the Argonauts or uh, Robin Hood. Uh, and it, yeah, they're, they're great, they're wonderful. Um, but I know sometimes they're not as relatable. I mean, they're, they're aspirational, inspirational, but in ways that seem a little bit remote. Mm -hmm. So I loved like, you know, as I got a little bit older, I, I would read Tolkien and you know, reading about characters like Frodo Baggins, who's just the seemingly ineffectual. Mild-mannered. You know, yeah, exactly. Just more somebody that's, yeah, more ready for a Liberty Fund discussion uh, to, to sit around and chat over tea than to. Yes, and cakes. And, 
Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's all about cakes, tea, cheese, maybe smoking some of that uh, that fine herb of their uh, their valley there. But you know, not to go and fight orcs and climb into a volcano and toss uh, a ring in there and, and, and try to even remotely hope to make it back. Like, um, but you know, this guy takes on this task, maybe not fully realizing what he was in for, but having some inclination of it. And to me, that's something we can relate to, right? There's times where we think, man, did I get over my head doing this? Um, but then we think, you know, there is, there is beauty and there's truth and it is worth making hard choices for. Um, it's worth taking a stand over and doing hard uh, and dangerous things. And because without that, life may not be worth living. And, um, and so I think that's, I, I wanted to tell a story that was inspirational, but also relatable. So, so I'm, what I had hoped was a lot of people would put themselves in the shoes of that uh, and say, Yeah, I, I may not be the biggest, wealthiest, strongest, most powerful, most influential person, but there are choices that I can make that can make a difference. One of my, in the research for this, one of the things I enjoyed a lot was, was watching this documentary, um, Berlin Wall, and it mentioned that somebody was, um, some, some guy was being interviewed. He was going up to the wall, he had a sledgehammer in hand, and uh, a reporter asked him, they said, hey, what, uh, what makes you think that you can go up and do this? And he said, you know, if that Chinese fella can do what he did, then I can do this. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's in the impact that this one man has had on global liberty. And the saddest part to me is he is much more iconic for the entire rest of the world, except for his own homeland, his own country. We should have had more uh, memes in during uh, lockdowns. Be like Tank Man. Totally. Yeah, exactly. Okay, no, this is not okay. We don't get to shut down our oh yeah churches yeah. and synagogues and um, schools and yeah and businesses. You know, there, yeah, there's people that that went up against that, and it's tough. It's really, really hard because. It's a tremendous amount of courage, and and you risk a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you know fines and other penalties. It's like how much can you withstand? But, but yeah, you know, it's just that's what we need is people who are willing to say this is not fair, this is not right, and we will not tolerate it. Uh, and I feel like that's what happened to this guy, and so and we're all capable of doing it, and we all have to run that equation too, you know, but. And, can't do it for every situation, it seems. Uh, otherwise, we'd be flattened by tanks pretty quickly. But, uh, <laughs> it's uh, pretty frequently, but you know, it's, it's uh, great. Gotta, I have a couple of similar questions um, from Facebook and Instagram. Andy Monroe uh, said, have there been people in the U.S. who have tried to cancel Tank Man and uh, bring the dozer on Instagram says, which corporations wanting to cozy up to the Chinese with corporations wanting to cozy up to the Chinese market. Do you fear works like your film might get banned off of, of YouTube? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great, those are two great questions. Um, so the, the uh, canceling Tank Man has been interesting. Most people have been very receptive to it, which has been nice and actually to the point that surprised me. Um, mm -hmm. I think because Ed, this is a great part of the art is ev almost everybody, if, if there's a hero, almost everybody wants to see themselves in their shoes, right? right? So I'll go to film festivals that will, I don't know, you know, you've been to them. Most film festivals, I would say the demographics would skew to older, white, wealthy progressives. That's, that's the usual audience. And at the very least, the, the, you know, if you skip out on those other qualities, 
the progressive worldview is is the one that's that's not departing for the most part. Mm-hmm. So I get to go and I'm doing Q and A's and people like the film, they like the character and they're nodding their heads when I'm talking. And I say, see, this is what happens when you combine socialism with power. And they keep nodding their heads because they <laughs> bought in. And so it's just this wonderful way kind of to insidiously, I mean, I'm not trying to fool anybody. I'm just trying to tell a true story. You know, I'm trying to be an artist and, and bring truth. And I, and I think that is truth. And I want to share that with them. And I think in that moment, I mean, they're along for the ride, but at the very least, hopefully it's giving them a little bit of a challenge that maybe they think and say, maybe there's a little something to that. They go home with a little more cognitive dissonance so that eventually as they consume enough art and truth um, that they will see, ah, you know, maybe the beauty doesn't lie with the way I've been seeing things. There are better answers out there and maybe I should see them. And so that's incredibly rewarding. Uh, as far as canceling Tank Man, the closest that we've come is there's kind of, there will be sometimes arguments from um, Chinese students in particular. Who, uh, they've been fed a certain narrative about what happened. And obviously, you know, I don't know, I wasn't there. Um, I have a strong inclination and I'll get this from actually conservatives in the U.S., some as well, that will say, you know, or even not conservatives, some some kind of political bent that doesn't want to go to war with China, which I, I understand. I don't want to go to war with China either. Um, but, uh, you know, say, well, this is the U.S.'s fault. This was a CIA-manufactured event. There were protests all across the uh, country in various states. We know about the Tiananmen Square one in Beijing because they had journalists there um, because Gorbachev was was meeting with Deng Xiaoping and so it got a ton of attention but there were protests all over the country at that same time and I think you're giving the CIA way too much credit but I think there could have been some sort of CIA involvement but I think it's one of those attaching yourselves to things that already existed right so just because maybe someone somewhere uh receive some funds or benefit from the state doesn't mean it's not an authentic movement as well. And I truly believe it was. And having met people who were protesters, um, they're not all set up in, you know, Aruba with their uh, beachfront houses, you know, I mean, these are people who have struggled for various reasons. Right? I believe home and can't return and are very sad about that. And they are very genuinely, um, you know, advocates of liberty and democracy. And, and I, yeah, I, it's so to me it, it's funny because we'll yeah the only people we'll get canceled for from our kind of our attempts to cancel us are from those two kinds of parties I, i'm sorry i i talked to myself what was the second question uh, on there if you can scroll back at all um yeah about the corporations so, corporations uh with corporations cozying up to the chinese market do you fear works like your film might get if not banned then at least kind of shadow banned oh uh, uh, completely and it's not just it's more insidious than that right it's the chill that it has that people don't want to make anything that could be challenging to the chinese government and don't want to be involved in any way with it I mean, people have talked about like Brad Pitt's films have been able to screen in China because he did Seven Years in Tibet. Um, you know, there are all sorts of factors. You, you've seen that probably John Cena's uh, apology. He said something about, ah, it's great. You know, he's just kind of off the cuff talking in some interview. It's wonderful. We get to be, um, you know, like the way things are now, like it's going to screen in countries like, Japan and Taiwan and China, you know, like at the same time it's being released here. He's talking about some, I forget, whatever his recent movie was in the last year too. Well, he referred to Taiwan as a country mm-hmm. on the same part. And China says, that's not true. China says that Taiwan is a mere vassal state of China. And so the pressure came down on him. And here you have this guy, right? This massive guy, the typical hero that we would think would be Tank Man, right? Very strong, you know, good looking, powerful. I mean, how much money does the guy have? A good amount, right? I mean, he's got 
what we would consider he has everything, every advantage in the world. And here he is on TV. I am so sorry. I did not mean to offend China and the Chinese people. I have nothing but respect for China. All of this stuff, all of this mea culpa, merely because he referred to Taiwan as an independent country. I mean, somebody came down the pike. And I mean, I understand, right? If China is threatening, we're not going to screen your film unless you apologize for us. And the studio comes down and says, you need to fix this. And, you know, because his money, all the, the people below him, you know, all the, the day player actors like myself would have been on there. You know, they're going to lose me. A lot to be lost. But at some point, I feel like you say, you know what? We'll take the hit, you know, go yourself. And, you know, uh, we don't need to apologize for anything like this. It's absurd. But everyone is terrified. And. I get it. I understand. There's a lot of money to be made from China, but I don't. Uh, I know for me, I don't need that money. I'm okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about some of your other uh, creative productions and uh, work as an actor. You were in the Pursuit of Happiness with Will and Jada Smith, a very inspiring story about the value of work and family. So. What was that like? What were some of the differences um, between being in a big budget production and uh, versus the making of small independent films? Better food? <laughs> oh yeah, that's for sure. Oh my gosh. It's funny now that you bring that up. I remember, I think it was a little bit after that where I did um, a student film. And those are sometimes fun to do because you know you get young people who are creative and I love kind of the, the independent scene. And like we were talking about, all those creative decisions that have to be made because you don't have all the money in the world. And like, somebody was asking, they're like, oh, you know, lunch is coming up. And somebody said, what's for lunch? And he said, bologna sandwiches. And this one kid was like, oh, all right. I was like, bologna sandwiches? Like, this, this is a violation of my SAG contract, you know? <laughs> I, I need to have a hot meal, you know? And it was like, okay, Robert, where are you at? And what's important? Like, I don't really care like what I'm going to eat or, or anything like that. Like I was happy to be there creating art with these people. And, um, but yeah, it was a big difference from, you know, like grilled swordfish and uh, you know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> that's, you know, Largely, it's funny because the, the union will always be sending these messages out. You've got to approve for this contract because, you know, it's going to get us better quality food on set. I'm like, who cares about the food? I mean, good food is great, but like, I think most of us want to work. Like, we want to do stuff, we want to create. Uh, that's the union is contrary to that, unfortunately. But uh, I feel like pursuit of happiness. I really lucked out because having a small role, I have no idea what the film's going to be about. You know, they've given me two to three pages. You know, I hope it's a good film. I hope it's something worth doing. I mean, I'm there for exposure, a paycheck, all those things, the chance to do the things that, that I love. But I don't know. Yeah, credit. Yeah, exactly. I don't have a clue. So, you know, when it comes out, I'm like, holy mackerel, this is actually a great film. This is inspiring. This is encouraging. This is the kind of thing that I want to work on. So really, yeah. really lucky for that. Was uh, was that also the experience um, when you were in the 2015 uh, film, Steve Jobs with Michael Fessbender? Um, did you also just get a couple of, of pages or, uh, you know, oh, yeah. and... and so yeah, yeah. same exact thing. I have no idea what the movie is going to be about. You know, I mean, I know it's about Steve Jobs, but that's it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, you know, so first thing I did is I, I downloaded Walter Isaacson's biography. Of okay. Him. So you did, even though you had this small part. What, what was yeah. I mean, to me, it was great. It was very funny because I, I, there was another actor there who had a small, smaller role, but, mm -hmm. um, but it was a, a real person like an actual like person, like with a name, uh, identifiable in Steve Jobs' life. And, uh, and, and I was, he's like, you know, I, I kind of have a reputation on set because I'll be like the guy who sits around reading. So people, you know, kind of weird, right? Because 
well, what would you say when I'm reading? So, well, rather than sitting and staring at a wall in a green, you know, green room or just keep eating all day, uh, a lot of people just graze. But, um, but this guy, he's like, yeah, you know, what are you reading? Oh, I'm reading the biography. And so, well, I mean, so who, who are you playing? And he told me, he said, well, you, you can read about him in the book. And he was like, wow, he even crosses my mind. <laughs> I was amazed. I was like, I'd be the first to you know, try to find out what we actually know about the person. So, um, so yeah. yeah. And, uh, I do was, a lot uh, of um, uh, film productions at, at my house. I, you know, rent out the space through Pure Space and um, that your anecdote about reading kind of triggers a uh, uh, recollection is that people are just mesmerized and kind of mystified and baffled by all my books. You know, uh, it's a huge like wall of, of, of books. And I remember it was uh, like a rap video or something. And um, one of the, the, the guys that was involved in the production came up and said, wow, are you a librarian? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah um, but I, I think it just speaks to the fact that, um, sadly, people aren't aren't reading anymore, and um, a lot of people aren't growing up with books, unlike you and I. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when people usually like, usually when people see my library, like the first question is not what what are those books, or you know, asking questions about them. Just did you read all those books? You know, just the fact that somebody would actually read them. Yes. Right. No, they're just there for decoration. <laughs> and, you know, I wish I had read all, all my books that I have. Right. I, I wish I could say that, but I aspire to. I try to. I try to get there. I'll be, I'll be happy to oh. have still full when I'm dead. But, uh, but I, yeah. I, uh, a lot of my books are, are from my grandmother, and those are, we have different political um orientations so i would i will not be reading a lot of those uh books um uh, <laughs> but along those great. lines the, the director of steve jobs i'm pretty certain uh, from from what i've heard from other people was he's he's a socialist i'll tell you he was one of the nicest guys i've ever met and that was really wonderful i mean just such a sweet wonderful man and you probably know you you deal in these circles enough that when you encounter somebody who's just genuinely nice, it's not, it's not always as frequent as you'd like. And it's just something to kind of be cherished. Uh, oh, yeah. Just great, great, wonderful. Like one of the nicest people I've met, period, let alone, I mean, if I just said that in Hollywood, that'd be one thing. But like in the world, like that's a whole other, he was just terrific. Really great guy. Amazing. Yeah. Reminds me of my interview last week with, uh, with Jack Carr and uh, talking about the set of the terminal list yeah. and how everybody was really positive and, and just this idea of uh, going out of your way to, to make somebody's day. And uh, I think, you know, he sees it as an end in and of itself. Um, I see it more as something that, that you should do because um, being kind to others is also good for you. It's not a sacrifice and, uh, oh. it'll, it'll come back to you. So, um, and you're just participating in the kind of world that you want to, to live in by modeling, uh, modeling good behavior. So I want to um, go to another one of your projects. This year, you were in a fictional detective podcast series, Tucson Heat, which is yeah. what you must be in right now. Uh, and you worked with Eric Estrada in an episode called I'll Take the Rookie. So tell us a little bit about that. Do you see these types of series having potential to give promising directors and actors a new path without going through the studio system? Yeah, so um, uh, a, actually I'd never worked with the director before uh, on, on one of his projects. He was, uh, you know, in the arts, a lot of times we'll wear a lot of different hats and he's a talented photographer and he took promotional shots for a production of Pat on a Hot Tin Roof that I was in. And we got to know each other from that. And just a great, nice guy. And he approached me and said, hey, I've got this project. And I asked him more about the project. And he said, you know, he wanted it to be a film. But 
when COVID hit, it's like, okay, productions are shut down. You know, you can't make films when you got a six feet of art and all of that stuff. And so, so well, what, what can we do? And so um, they made this podcast series and, um, and, you know, yeah, and worked with this Eric Estrada and they said it was great. I never worked with him. It, it's, it's so fascinating in these podcasts, right? Because they will they'll record people independently of each other and stitch it together. And if everybody's done their job, how they're supposed to, including and especially the director, then everything's going to sound like it belongs that way. It's a really fascinating way to do it. But, but there are so many innovations that have created the opportunity for people of less means. I mean, feature film is a tremendous time and money commitment by and large. I mean, you can do things for more and less money, but to make something that's going to be comparable really to a uh, Hollywood production, like most of us don't have access to a few hundred million. And so this is an awesome opportunity. And it's been something that I know our, our friend again, Patrick Reason over here and I are working on a, um, turning a play. I was approached by, uh, by some of you guys ownership over a, a theater play and they wanted to do something with it to get out the ideas that are discussed in there. It's, it's basically a conversation between David Hume and Adam Smith. And so I said, well, you know, yeah, we could do it the traditional route of a play, but nowadays you never know, right? With pandemic lockdowns and things, you can do all this work and get shut down or people get COVID or whatever. And it can, can scrap things and as, as well as the fact that you've got to be in that time and at that place. And it's the magic of theater. It's wonderful, but it's expensive to engage in uh, for a very temporal um, product. So I said, why don't we turn this into an audio drama? Uh, you know, essentially the same kind of way. So if you're interested in that, so Patrick and I are going to be moving forward uh, on, on creating it into a reality with them. And we both have our own projects too, wanting to do along those lines, adapting existing material or original stories into an audio play format and even that satisfaction of having an artistic creation was cheaper without the visuals uh, that are required for, for an actual film. So, uh, and at the very least, it serves as proof of concept. You know, if your mm -hmm. audio drama version of it does well, it's a much easier sell to say, hey, we got a built-in audience now. we got these right. people. And um, they're enjoying taking, it. Taking and, things, I think, you know, kind of this, this uh, more step-by-step um, -step process is something Absolutely. that I think people get very in intimidated by um, doing a, a, a project because they think that they have to kind of do the, the final start version. The but, you know, you just start with, yeah. start with wh whatever you can, where you can. I know when right. um, I started doing the Draw My Life videos six years ago, I drew, drew them myself. I, you know, narrated them myself and, um, and, you know, I did the, the live drawing. So we found, wow, people really reacted. The quality obviously wasn't that super great, but that's part of also the appeal because it was, you know, very authentic, very unproduced. Um, and, but then we were able to say, okay, now we're going to hire a, a professional illustrator and now we're going to hire a professional voiceover person now i'm gonna ayn rand had to start with atlas shrugged it was like you either make that or nothing at all you know it's yeah she no that's so many things in between you know? that's why I, yeah the the early ayn rand remains for me one of my favorite you know compilations of of her work um because some of some there were sometimes frivolous um, stories, you know, and fun stories, and, and you could just see her beginning to uh, try try out her her skills and and put characters together. Um, now, listen, we only have another uh, six minutes, and I'd love to get to these questions from Mandy Lee and Bob and King Allen, but I didn't want to close out without talking a little bit about. Uh, your work with the Fully Informed Jury Association. Um, tell us about it for what, for those who don't know, uh, what is jury nullification? Why is it important? Yeah, so jury nullification 
technically speaking, is when a jury finds a defendant not guilty, though there is a, they are sure beyond a reasonable doubt that they did violate the law. Um, be a variety of reasons for it. In general, it's to create to prevent an injustice from occurring. Whether they find that the law is unjust or the application is unjust or um, the uh, punishment would be unjust. And this is something that there is a long heritage of. It basically started, in fact, the anniversary of it is, is considered to be September 5th. Uh, it's jury Rights Day is that day. So um, it'd be great for the listeners to be engaged with it by then. Um, they've got, uh, uh, it's an anniversary of William Penn's trial where he had, this was in, in England, he had uh, been accused of uh, assembling people without authorization. And um, so, and, and they couldn't get the jury, the judges couldn't get the jury to find them guilty. And they tried to throw them in prison and withhold food and water and, and smoke of all things, you know, of, of fire to light their, their tobacco. And the jury held strong. And then, a, and then a, a higher court said, you can't compel a jury to make a decision if you don't want to. And so it's this beautiful tradition that we saw being exercised during um, during the uh, fugitive slave law days before the Civil War, where juries would say, yeah, we're, you know, we're finding the slave not guilty. We're finding people who allied with them not guilty. Um, and we saw it during Prohibition, um, where you had uh, folks, there's one case of the, where the jury asked to see the evidence beforehand uh, while, while they're making their decision. And um, they happened to, uh, the evidence disappeared while it was in their possession. It might have been consumed by said members of the jury. And they said, oh, being that there's no, there's a lack of evidence, we're going to have to find the defendant not guilty. So it's this great response to unjust rules that are out there. It's the citizen's last resort. And there is a, um, there's a online webinar on August 9th. If you go to Fiji.org, uh, you can sign up for that or visit the, uh, the Facebook page for it. Right. We'll uh, ask our team to put the, uh, the link yeah. into uh, the chats across all of our platforms. Um, and this is bringing us to the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much. This was really a lot of fun. A um, little bit different than uh, our usual format, although, as I mentioned before, increasingly we are, as would be my preference, having on more authors, novelists, playwrights, right. actors. So, um, so, so very good stuff. Uh, I want to uh, let people know if, uh, if you haven't yet gotten your ticket to the Atlas Society Gala, you're going to have an opportunity to um, network and interact with spectacular uh, friends and artists like uh, Robert Anthony Peters. So please make sure to go and do that. And, uh, and if you like the work of the Atlas Society, go ahead and uh, hit us up with a tax deductible donation. We are a nonprofit and we rely on your investment to, to bring you great programs like this. So. Thank you, Robert, um, and uh, look yeah. forward to yeah seeing you uh, again soon. Thank you.